Good morning. Welcome to this time of worship with First Baptist Church of Fort Payne, Alabama. I'm Marshall Henderson, the pastor of First Baptist Church. Our church exists because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we believe that the gospel is at the very heart of the message of the Bible, and it's at the very heart of who we are as God's people. It means that the gospel forms every part of our lives, and it informs every dimension of who we are and what we do as God's people. So in light of the gospel, we live for the sake of Jesus Christ. And we desire as a church to make Jesus Christ known through heartfelt worship, through disciple making, through missional living, and through devoting ourselves to one another in community. So today, however you're watching, I want you to know that the desire of our leadership is that you enter into a genuine and heartfelt time of worship with us as a church. Jesus is worthy of our praise, and he is worthy of all of our attention and our affection. And now, for all who are weary and need rest, and for all who mourn and long for comfort, and for all who fail and desire strength, and for all who sin and need a Savior, this church opens wide its doors to you. You are welcomed into worship this morning with a welcome that comes from Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship. morning. Welcome into worship this morning with First Baptist Church. It is a blessing to join in worship together. Uh, as you're coming in, uh, Dr. Danny or, or Mark would have given you a communion cup. If you don't have one of those, you can grab one of those now or they'll, they'll get with you a little bit later. Uh, so great to worship together. If you're a guest with us this morning, I'm glad you're here. My name is Marshall Henderson. I'm the pastor of First Baptist Church. If we haven't met, I would love to meet, with, meet you and connect with you. I'm usually right here after the service, and so I'd love to spend some time with you this morning. Uh, we have a guest with us this morning. Roger is, is out, and so uh, my friend Callum Sears. Callum's on staff at Grace Presbyterian Church here in town. Uh, he'll be joining our crew, Trish and Robin and Steve, this morning and leading us in worship. Uh, just kind of one housekeeping note as we go into this. Uh, you'll see because Callum leads from the piano, this screen is down. And so um, you've got a song sheet, you've got a lyric sheet in your bulletin, and also there several of our songs are in the hymnal. You'll see those page numbers on the screen there for you. So between the hymnal and the lyric sheet, I even put a few extra on this section over here, the farthest away from the television. You'll see those on the end of the aisle. Um, so you should be covered this morning as far as worship goes. Uh, we're looking forward to a wonderful day of worship. Uh, as followers of Christ this morning, we'll come around the Lord's table together. It's an opportunity to remember our Lord's sacrifice for us. It's to rehearse the gospel, to celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, coming around the Lord's table is not just a thing that we do. It is an opportunity to hear the gospel again, to hold uh, these elements in our hands, uh, to really wrap our hands around the grace of Jesus Christ, and so it's an opportunity for all of us to draw near to the cross, for Jesus to keep us near the cross. Listen, Jesus wants to lead you in a magnificent, crucified life following him. And his promise for everyone who will follow him, his promise is life. So we draw near to that today. So for all who are weary and need rest, for all who mourn, and long for comfort, for all who fail and desire strength, and for all who sin 
and need a Savior, this church opens wide its doors to you. You are welcomed into worship this morning with a welcome that comes from Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship. As we begin, I'll ask you to stand with me as we turn our attention toward our hope in Jesus Christ. If you'll stand, you'll have words on the screen here, affirming words of our hope from the New City Catechism. I'll read the portions in white if you'll join in the portions in yellow. The question is, what is our only hope in life and death? For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. The Lord be with you. Let us worship God. Let's sing together in Christ alone. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. Heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, Fullness of God in helpless be this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. On him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, bursting forth. Glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No 
power of hell, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. So, boys and girls, I want you to play a little game with me this morning. We're going to play the Who Am I game. So, I'm going to give you some clues about a person and see if you can guess who this person is. I have blonde hair. I like glitter. I teach people how to play the piano. Who am I? Miss Robin. <laughs> so one day Jesus was talking with his disciples, and they didn't exactly play the who am I game, but Jesus did ask them, who do people say that I am? In Mark chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, it says, and they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. Not everyone who heard about Jesus or who saw Jesus really knew who he was. Jesus was a nice man. He was a good teacher. And it was amazing how he could perform miracles. But Peter saw more than those things. When Peter said, you are the Christ, Peter was recognizing Jesus as our Savior. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus came to die for our sins so we could be forgiven. In verse 34, it says, And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, we can deny ourselves, and as the Message Bible puts it, we can let Jesus be in the driver's seat and be in charge of our lives because we can trust him. Jesus gave his life for us so we can follow him without fear. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for sending him to die for our sins. Help us, Father, to see him as he truly is. Help us to worship him, love him, and follow him. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we um, sing our next song, Is He Worthy? I just I want to read from uh, Revelation 5, which is the passage that this song is taken from. Um, it's just a wonderful uh, picture. We get a glimpse into the, the throne room of heaven here in Revelation 5. And, um, and we see the, the gathered saints around the throne of God. And uh, in, in the Lord's hand is a scroll containing all of the plans and the purposes of God for this earth, uh, including uh, our salvation. And no one on heaven and on earth um, is um, worthy and capable of opening this scroll and to look inside of it, except for one. And John sees in his vision um, a lamb standing as if it had been slain, uh, as though it had been slain. And um, the lamb goes over, um, and we see in Revelation 4 that this clearly represents uh, Jesus Christ. And he goes over and he takes the scroll and he opens it, and the whole uh, uh, heavenly host erupts in praise. The only one worthy on heaven and earth to fulfill all the plans of God um, is Jesus Christ himself, and how amazing it is for us here on earth, how we um, can look to Christ as the one who is worthy on our behalf uh, to fulfill all the plans of God, all the, the whole law of God on our behalf. Um, and so we, we, we um, worship here today and boast not in our own worthiness before the Father, in our own good deeds before the Father, but we boast in the grace and the love and the mercy 
of the Lamb who was slain on our behalf. Uh, and so this is Revelation 5, 9. Um, I'll go to uh, verse uh, 12. Worthy are you to take the scroll. This is the heavenly host singing um, uh, as the Lamb takes the scroll. Worthy are you to take the scroll to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. If you would, please stand with us as we sing this song, Is He Worthy, together. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. We do. Is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? It is. And is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. And is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Let's sing this together. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The light of Judah who conquered the grave. He is David's root and lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe. Every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy?
Is he worthy? Is he worthy? We're going to sing another song together. I invite you to sing along with me if you know it. It's uh, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. And again, it just is um, really saturated with just great truths about who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Um, in particular, I love this uh, second verse when it says, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. He, the perfect Son of Man, in his living and in his suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. I love that. Of, of this truth that Jesus not only came to die for us, but he also came to live for us as well, that we might have his righteous life on our behalf as well. It goes on to say, see the true and the better Adam come to save the hell-bound man. That was our condition before, before Christ, before we met Christ. Christ, the great and the sure fulfillment of the law, in him we stand, in him we stand. And so again, may that truth resonate in our hearts, that it is not our own worthiness, our own right righteousness before the Father uh, that makes us worthy, but it is, um, it is Christ's righteousness on our behalf that we cling to uh, through faith. So I'm going to um, sing this first verse, and then again, please join with me if you know it. The lyric should be there on your sheet um, or on the um, uh, screen as well. Sing together, come behold. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Christ the Lord upon the tree. And in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the Lamb in a victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. How unwavering our hope, 
Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. What a foretaste of deliverance. How unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. Amen. Well, if you would please stand with us as we sing together, Behold the Lamb.
Would you pray with me? Father, we pray for Robin now. She's attended to and cared for. Would you please sustain her and strengthen her? And would you give wisdom to those that would care for her? God, thank you for people in our church that have the skill and knowledge to be able to do that. And so, Father, we pray for the remainder of our time together uh, that you would uh, speak to us through your word. We love you and pray this through Christ. Amen. Just want to take a second and dismiss the children to Children's Church now. Can can follow Amy out the side door as normal. Children, you're dismissed. And if you would stand with me as we read the scripture this morning. The scripture this morning comes from Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 35. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's We'll save it. This is the word of the Lord. In these initial moments, uh, allow me to do a little bit of of housekeeping. As you came in, uh, you would have been given a communion cup. If you don't have one of those in this moment, would you go ahead and slip up your your hand now? I think Dr. Danny's attending outside. Ryan, would you give me a hand? there's cups here on the front row. Oh, Beth has some. Just keep your hand up, uh, put your hand up, leave it up if you still need a communion cup, and we'll be able to get that to you. Um, also, David, let's go ahead and raise this, this screen as well. Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, so we're studying in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we go to the Scriptures weekly here. Uh, we read from the Scriptures because the Scriptures most clearly testify about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And so we go there. Uh, we've been studying through Mark, and as we get to this passage here in Mark chapter 8, this is a pivotal passage in the gospel. It really turns here as Mark narrates the life of Jesus. Uh, and really what we get here is a summary of the Christian faith and a summary of the life that the Christian should live. You know, as we think about this time of year, um, as We're going to walk into the season of Lent midweek this week. And I want to give you something on the screen here for you. Um, We're providing a a Lent devotional for you Um, each day during Lent. That starts on Wednesday. It's it's a 40-day period leading up to Easter. Uh, Lent is a season for inspection, a season for repentance, for drawing near to the Lord, and really loading up to celebrate on Easter. Now, what this is is a daily devotional that will be provided to you electronically. Uh, We also also have some some hard copies of this as well, but here's how you can get involved with this daily devotional. It'll be sent to you. So if you want it through text message, you have my permission right now in these holy moments to pull out your cell phone to text FBCFPLENT to that number, 94,000. So you can do that now. 
you get an email, you get a text message that kicks back to you. It's an opt-in thing. But now, once you sign up for that, there will be a link sent to you every day during Lent. You open it up, you read the devotional God provided. You can also do this through email by emailing our secretary, Caitlin, at fbcfp.org. We'll leave that up there for just a little bit for you. Uh, also, you'll get an email and a text message out to you to, to make sure you have every opportunity to opt in. But now's a good time to do that, uh, and you can do that now. All right, so diving into Mark chapter 8. Here in Mark chapter 8, uh, this is the summary that Tim Keller provides for Jesus' conversation with Peter and his disciples and any, anyone who would follow after him. He says, I am a king, but I'm a king going to a cross. And if you want to follow me, you've got to come to the cross too. But before Jesus says that, as you notice we picked up in verse 22 this morning, before he says something just like this, He spits into a blind man's eyes. Is that not odd to anybody? Sometimes we read the Bible so holy, we're like, but you know, we're going to stop and say, what? What's happening there? It's an odd story of Jesus healing a blind man. Mark, as we know, Mark is retelling the Apostle Peter's story of Jesus. Uh, He was a protege, a, a, a translator, and a secretary for Peter. And so Peter would tell this story. Mark writes down this story, so not only did it happen, but Mark puts it in. And Mark puts it in right here, right in front of this pivotal passage. It's the lead-in to this moment of Jesus saying, I'm going to the cross, and you must follow me. Now, Jesus healed in a multitude of ways. Uh, This is the way that I'm probably least comfortable with, personally, right? Right? Maybe you are, too. Jesus spit in a man's eyes. And maybe you think, well, in the first century, maybe that spitting on someone was a way of saying, I love you. It wasn't. You remember as Jesus was going uh, toward the, or Jesus was going toward crucifixion, um, he was spit upon, he was slapped. It was not, it was not a, an endearing term there. And what's even more bizarre about this passage Uh, is that when Jesus does this and touches the man's eyes, it doesn't take on the first try. He He has to touch them again and go from there. The man says, I see men, but they look like trees. And so Jesus laid his hands on the man's eyes again, and his sight was restored. It's so strange. I remember being a young man in my 20s, uh, having already had the call toward ministry and just very eager to learn. And so I remember a, a pastor preaching on this particular passage, and I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, okay, it's time to get these questions solved. Right? Jesus spitting on people. Jesus having to touch him twice to heal him. Like, what was that? And so the pastor's point, I love this, but he says, sometimes you need a second touch from Jesus. That's not helpful. Like, what does that even mean? And so I remember walking away, like, I don't, okay, I still don't, I still don't know. Here, here's, what, here's, here's what I think. Jesus always acted intentionally. There's no movement of Jesus that's wasted. And this story about Jesus is retold intentionally. We learn that this this story of Jesus healing the blind man right before this passage is what you might call a, a visible parable. It illustrates what's about to happen next. Just as the blind man receives his sight by degrees, the disciples in the following scene and throughout the rest of this gospel account will receive their sight by degrees. So really, these two passages together are about two miracles of sight. Up until this point, all were spiritually blind to exactly who Jesus is. The crowds see Jesus, but they think he's a prophet. Jesus presses his disciples and asks them, well, who do you say that I am? Christ, Peter confesses. Finally, they see They've been looking for a king, and they found him. Before we get into the, really the, the bulk of the passage, let me just give you a couple, just two devotional thoughts before we move forward. This is sort of my riffing on this, this miracle of a blind man. First thought is this, Jesus is so patient and steady. He could do the healing in one touch, but he did it in two. That's why. I mean, why, why did Jesus do it in two? He could do it in one. He just did it in two. That's, that's as deep as we can go there. And Jesus' slowness, as 
we perceive it, or as many perceived it, was frustrating for those who encountered him. There were times when the crowds clamored for a king and they wanted to make him king in the moment by force, and Jesus slips away. It's not time. Even in this, Jesus tells this he tells the blind man and then tells his disciples, and, and say nothing about me being the Messiah. So his slowness can be frustrating, but there's a, there's a glorious inefficiency about Jesus. And don't get up in arms that I call Jesus inefficient. It's a glorious inefficiency. Do you want the word efficient to describe the shepherd of your soul? No, you want efficient and expedient to describe the person bagging your food at lunch today. But Jesus did things differently. Jesus held hands with the dead girl at her bedside. Jesus took moments to weep at the tomb of a friend. Jesus spoke to his disciples in botanical terms about their lives bearing fruit, that from a good heart that you bear good fruit. You remember him saying something like that? Not... You don't, it's not that you, you don't bear a good product from a good mechanized assembly line. You bear good fruit. And even in this following passage, nobody really, 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 really understands who Jesus is. The disciples see he's the Christ, but they have a long way to go. It's, it's still some progress ahead of them. Now think about Jesus working this way. I, I, I love starting fires. I truly do. I always have, from a very young age, I've loved starting fires. And I found a healthy way to channel that love. <laughs> it is to build fire pits and to gather friends around a fire pit and spend time around a fire pit with friends. Now, here's the, here's the issue. Is I'm terrible at building lasting fires. I'm good at starting them, I think. Building them to last, not so good at it. It's, it's actually pitiable at this point. Uh, one time I built a really great fire, and I bragged to a friend that you can call me the Boy Scout of Lookout Mountain, and since then, nothing will stay aflame. Like, like pride always comes before the downfall. It's biblical, it's true, it's happening with my fire pit in my backyard. Now, here's the, here's the thing. Sometimes I notice after I've tried to build this fire and keep it going, like I'll give up, I'll go inside, you know, you slide the sliding door shut, and I, I notice something very frustrating. I look outside, and I look inside the fire pit, and you know what's happening? The fire's up and going, away from me. And it's just burning, burning away. And then oftentimes I think, like, what was the issue here? The issue was mostly me. Like, there's, there's haste, there's hurry. I want to build a big fire quickly. You know, you make some errors. You get wood that's not quite ready, maybe a little bit damp. You know, I haven't gathered enough kindling and on and on. I've been impatient with the whole thing. It usually traces its way back to my haste. But I look outside and the fire's burning. You think, well, what is that all about? Well, the coal and the ashes, they remain hot for a long time, don't they? And you've got, at this point, just some really pure heat going on. Maybe the wood that wasn't quite ready is a little bit drier now from the heat. There's a right kind of breeze and airflow that comes in at the right time, and then flame. Jesus is so patient and steady because his work is drawing you into his heart. And Jesus doesn't do it at knife point. And Jesus doesn't do it at the end of a gun barrel. You see, when Jesus calls you to himself, the dominant verbs for your life from this point forward are believe, follow, love. None of those verbs are done in a hurry. And don't you think Jesus knows that? The Christian life is not to impress so it's not about haste and hurry and the lighter fluid of spirituality. Instead, consider how patient Jesus is. Consider what kind of journey Jesus is calling you to. A deep, burning, holy heart. Second devotional thought I can think of is the mouth of Jesus is a fountain of life and healing. The mouth, the mouth of Jesus is a fountain of life and healing. And that's actually... Better to say than Jesus spits on people. But think about this. Jesus spits on a man to heal him. It was not a loving, a loving thing. Jesus was beaten and spit his, he was spit into his face at one point and while he was being mocked by soldiers. But in the scene that comes next, Jesus is going to say some of the hardest words there is to swallow. 
Jesus always has hard words because Jesus is the risen Christ. He's not us. Our way leads us to ruin. His way leads us to life. He's going to disagree with us because he's God. That's his role. We're not. But we have to know that everything that proceeds from the mouth of Jesus is good and holy. So nothing needs to be filtered to make Jesus a more life-giving Savior. You think about that? Nothing of Jesus needs to be filtered out to make him more life-giving. He's doing just fine. And really to the point, this, as Jesus calls his disciples to come, to follow, to come and die, to come and die sounds like the end, but Jesus calls that moment when you come and die, he calls it the moment when life truly begins. So if his spit is healing, surely his words that say come and die are healing and life too. So we go into the bulk of this passage, verses 27 through 35, as have been read for us. And I, I, we'll explore this under two headings. First heading is this, don't waste your life, Jesus. The second heading is, Jesus will never waste your life. So don't waste your life, Jesus, and Jesus will never waste your life. So don't waste your life. This is a quote, this is from Peter. This is Peter telling Jesus not to waste his life. So what comes next? Peter goes from star pupil to spawn of Satan in the matter of verses. And it's a pivotal scene because the disciples recognize the true identity of Jesus. Uh, that's the one they're following. The crowds don't see it yet. Uh, the masses see Jesus. Maybe he's John the Baptist. Maybe he's Elijah. Maybe he's a prophet. They say, but no, we see, Peter steps up says, we see it. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. He's the one. And this is a special theological term that Jesus is the Christ. Christ was not his last name. It's a theological term. It's what's odd sometimes. It's sort of ironic when people say things to you, like because you study, they say, you know, don't give me any of that theology. Just preach Jesus Christ. The word Christ is a theological term, and it's a weighty theological term. It means he's the anointed one. He's the coronated king. He's the king to end all kings, the king to put everything right. And even when Jesus says that the Son of Man must suffer, he's drawing that phrase, Son of Man, from Daniel chapter 7, a passage where the one would come in power with his angels to set everything right. So that's what they're talking about here. You are the coming king who will set all things right. You will make all evil right it again. This is what they're looking at. And it's such an important moment for Peter. Peter steps up and says, we see it. There's a moment where Jesus says, yes, 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 God has opened your eyes, you've seen this. And then it comes crashing down just immediately after this. Verses 31 through 33, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And turning and seeing his, his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So Peter turns on Jesus immediately after this great confession, because Jesus spoke plainly to them about what was going to happen next. It was very shocking for them. I must suffer and I must be put to death. You know, every vision of the Christ, every vision of the king they would have had would, would have seen this Christ not going to a cross or not dying. That's not what the Messiah did, die in shame. The Messiah, the Christ, would go from strength to strength, not being killed by wicked men, but putting an end to all of them. And Jesus says something like this, Yes, I'm the king. I came not to rule but to serve. Came not to take power but to lose it. Came not to live but to die. And that's how I'm going to put everything right. And in this moment, at the height of human pride, man takes God aside and rebukes him. Don't waste your life, Jesus. Don't throw your moment away, Jesus. Uh, my sister-in-law, Hayden, uh, in her early 20s, spent time working as, in an office as a secretary, and she started at a new place at one point, and uh, she was getting to know the, the secretary she worked with. Now, the, at the time, this other secretary didn't know that she 
was a Christian. And so uh, as they're kind of like talking about their family, the other person said to my wife's sister, you know, my sister is kind of stupid. She's wasting college. She's wasting her degree. She's throwing away her young life, and she's, do- she's going on and on about everything she's throwing away to go and take care of orphans in Africa. She's wasting her moment. You know, the cross is so opposed to the way that we normally think. The cross is so opposed to the way that we normally think that change happens. I mean, we're sucked into it all the time. We think that real change happens in governmental power, institutional influence, having the right number of people and the right number of seats, pushing the right number of buttons, pulling the right levers, calling the shots. So let's not give Peter too hard of a time here. In fact, every common sense value that seems to be out there seems to be on Peter's side. How can it be right for unjust men to kill a just man? Isn't that what the Christ was going to put an end to? I mean, Peter's Peter's rebuke and Peter's question here has some weight, doesn't it? How can you win by losing? Jesus knows that the deepest evil that he needs to overthrow cuts through the heart of every person. Jesus knows that our deepest need is to be reconciled with God. And so every other messianic design we might have is inferior because Jesus came to do that. And everything we need flows out of the cross and back into the world. Everything beautiful, everything humane, everything reconciling, it flows out of the cross into the world. So Jesus says, I must die to save. I must lose to win. And Jesus went through losing in this way. His death, he talks about that, but also in three days he'll rise. His death and resurrection broke the hold of sin and broke the power of death over all mankind. Let's just think about this for a moment. So Jesus' death and resurrection broke the hold of sin. So here's the hold of sin. Christ willingly laid down his life on the cross in the place of ours. He absorbed the cosmic debt of our sin. He paid it all so we can be forgiven and reconciled to God. But also the power of death, that every evil person and every evil institution controls with the fear that goes with their power. I mean, think about it. Think about how people move you in your life. Like, think about how people move you with your fear of them, fear that they might reject you, fear that they might shame you, fear that they might hurt you. It's a power, isn't it? And the greatest of this power is death. When you know someone can kill you, you're scared. And you may say, well, well, no. I'm not. I'm a Christian. And I would say exactly. You know, when Jesus died, he took the very worst death could offer. Every abusive and unjust way that the power of death is wielded, Jesus took it. But the resurrection of Jesus was God's definitive statement that death hadn't won and death will never win. Jesus, he called him, Jesus called himself the resurrection and the life. Everyone who believes in him, though he dies, he lives. That's how you win by losing. When Jesus exhausted the greatest enemy's final and greatest weapon, and when that greatest weapon has no more sting, Jesus became the victor over every kind of darkness. Fear's spell is broken. Now think about it now. There's no no power of death anymore. The very worst threat to your life. Certainly, we're afraid of rejection, shame, exposure, someone to hurt us, but the very worst threat on your life, death. You know what it does now if you're a follower of Jesus Christ? It just delivers you into the loving arms of your Father. The very worst thing that can happen to you in Jesus Christ 
is the very best thing that can happen to you through Jesus Christ. So Jesus, uh, really Peter is smacked back with a hard rebuke from Jesus. You know, when Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, to Peter, like when Jesus calls you Satan, it's a bad day for you, you know? But you, you see the connection here. It's like, why does he call Peter Satan? Well, because Satan already, in Jesus' temptation, Satan has tried to convince Jesus to be a different kind of king before. You know, any time we desire to custom make our terms to Jesus, you know, any time that we filter Jesus instead of following him, so any time we filter Jesus instead of following him, man's way and the devil's way become a singular path. And you know the scary truth is? Is that any one of us can find ourselves in the place of Peter? Any one of us, when we desire to take Jesus by the hand and lead him toward our happiness and toward our fulfillment and toward our visions of a victorious life, instead of Jesus taking us by the hand and leading us his way, any one of us could be in the position of Peter, walking that devilish path. That is the mistake of Peter we often make. And that mistake of Peter certainly deserves the rebuke of Jesus, just like Peter. But we end here. There's a way forward. Verses 34 and 35. Jesus will never waste your life. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, Jesus said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. If anyone would follow after me, Jesus says, anyone can follow in the way that leads to life. And you know, in the Greek, do you know what the word anyone means? It means anyone. Anyone can follow in a path that leads to life. For Jesus to lead us in his eternal life means that Jesus is also leading us, it says here, into a crucified life. It says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross. Now, he didn't say, if anyone would come after me, let him improve himself and come on, but deny himself. We come to Jesus with the admission that we cannot pilot our own lives. We come in weakness giving up rights to our own lives, we start in weakness knowing that we need a Savior. And sometimes like Peter, we can't imagine how life would triumph in that kind of, you know, Peter can't see how life can triumph through the death of the Messiah, through the death of the Christ. And it's hard for us to imagine the glory of a crucified life, for Jesus to say, come and die, and that's glorious. It's hard to imagine that, isn't it? But what if it's right? What if the way up is the downward way of the cross? What if the way to fullness is sacrifice? What if the way to exaltation is humility? What if the way to influence is to honor others? What if the way to, of success is to work in smallness? What if the way to joy is to praise another what if the way to gain everything is to freely lose everything for the sake of Jesus? Jesus' words are a fountain of life and healing. And if he leads you there, you will surely find life there. There's glory on that road. And we'll see it clearly one day. We'll, we'll look back and we'll see that this life was more magnificent than we ever could have imagined. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity talks about it this way. He encourages us to lose our lives in this way. Give up yourself, and you will find your real self. Lose your life, and you will save it. Submit to death, the death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day, and the death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being, and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have given away will will really be, you have not given away, will really be yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. 
Look for yourself, and, in, and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ, and you will find him, and with him, everything else thrown in. Listen, church, every pursuit that begins and ends with you will end in the past tense. People will talk about it in the past tense. But every pursuit that begins and ends with Jesus will last forever. And some of you are there. Some of you are living there. Some of you are living this bloodstained, crucified life following Jesus. And I would just say, keep going. It's glory. Jesus invites you to a place where he knows you will never be loved. Jesus invites you to a life where he knows that not one moment will be wasted. Won't you come? Won't you follow? This morning we go together to the Lord's table. You should have your cups already with you. Jesus left behind for us this ongoing practice for his church is to keep us near the cross, is to keep us near that call upon our lives. As we come to the table this morning, hear the words from 1 Corinthians 11. Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we take of the Lord's Supper this morning, I want to invite you just in these moments to participate in what's been called the five looks. Five looks. We'll walk, we'll walk through them together. First, we look within in self-examination. The Lord's Supper is not for everyone. It's only for sinners. If you're not a sinner, this meal is not for you. But among those sinners is for those who have repented and believe in Jesus Christ. So I ask you this morning, have you come to the end of yourself? Have you relinquished your life and trust to Jesus? Here at First Baptist Church, we practice open communion. You don't have to be a member of this church to partake of this meal with us this morning, but you do have to be one who has repented and who trusts Jesus for his or her salvation. Friends, this look inward of self-examination is an ongoing practice. So this morning, Will you examine yourself? This morning, will you deny yourself? Will you take up your cross and follow? We also look back together in remembrance. Every time we come to the table, we remember and then we proclaim a story. That on the cross, Jesus had his body broken for you and for me. He had his blood shed for you and for me. We tell the story of the great rescue of Jesus, the great salvation of Jesus through his death on the cross. Jesus willingly laid down his life on the cross. In the place of ours, he absorbed the cosmic debt of sin. He paid it all so we can be forgiven and reconciled to God. This morning, we remember that story. We proclaim that story. Will you look back in remembrance? Third, we look up in praise. We just look up in pure wonder over who God is. God, you freely loved us, we say this morning. God, you gave yourself willingly. God, you won our hearts eternally. Will you look up and praise? The Lord's Supper is not mechanical. It's not church theater. 
It's a moment for us to bathe in the love of God. To lift up your heart in gratitude and in praise to God this morning. Fourth, we look around in fellowship. So do it. Just take a moment. Look around the room. Just look at one another. Maybe even make awkward eye contact with one another. We take the bread and the cup how? Together. We are reminded of our unity with one another through Jesus Christ. Jesus is so patient and steady. Jesus is forming us into his image. And we're reminded in these moments as we share a common cup that we belong to one another. And we're able to celebrate the story of God's grace and God's redemption in the life of one another. So yes, we live side by side with one another in love and in a safe environment with expectation, making disciples of one another with one another. And we say to one another in this moment of communion, with the same patient love and true desire of Jesus, I'm looking into your life and your life and your life, and I'm seeing where God's grace is taking you, and I want to be a part of it. So we look around in fellowship. Lastly, we look forward in anticipation. Paul tells us that as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He comes again, doesn't he? So we're hopeful, we're joyful, we anticipate the day when he returns to make all things new, to dwell with us forever, and to see on that day the magnificent crucified life that he has led us on, and not one moment has been wasted. So friends, would you take your bread and open your top portion? Church family, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. If you'd open the the cup portion, Jesus told us that this is the blood of the covenant poured out for many. Church family, this is the blood of Christ given for you. Take and drink. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we remember your mighty acts. We, in sharing the bread and the cup, have tasted and seen that you are good. We are sharing and proclaiming the mystery of our faith, that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. As you've nourished our souls in the assurance of your love and presence, we ask that you send us in peace. Send us out humble, diligent, and grace-filled to be workers in your kingdom, filling the world with your love. We desire to be your people this morning in every possible way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll close this morning by singing the doxology. Do what? Steve will lead us. That's good. He will lead us out on that. But before we do that, before I ask you to stand for our doxology, I'll give you a couple reminders just as we go out. The first is you're invited, as you always are, week in and week out, to give of your tithes and offerings as an act of worship. Those offering plates are located behind you in the foyer. If you're not part of a, a Sunday school group or a group that meets, I'd love to invite you in one this morning. They meet right after this service throughout the building. If you're not part of one of those, I can help you connect with one. I invite you into that. This week on Tuesdays, the Golden Circle meets at a new time. That's 10 a.m. on Tuesdays, so time change there. And then New Beginnings, the Widows Group will meet right after that as well on Tuesday. 
You'll see in your bulletin, uh, there's a couple things for you here. Uh, the first I want you to look at is on March 13th, that's a Sunday evening. Uh, we're going to have uh, something called the Church and Mental Health. My friend Rachel Pacuary is a licensed professional counselor, and she's going to spend time with us just talking about something that we don't really talk about that often or that well in the church, how, the, how discipleship and mental health touch, how following Jesus and mental health go hand in hand. She's going to talk to us about what it is to be emotionally healthy followers of Jesus Christ. And so I hope you make plans to be a part of that. Uh, it should be an enriching time and an equipping time for us all. Also, I'll invite you uh, this Wednesday at 6 p.m. All of our groups are going to meet together. Uh, youth and, and older will meet together in the sanctuary on Wednesday night for an Ash Wednesday service. It's to mark the beginning of the season of Lent uh, through a service of inspection and examination, uh, reflection and meditation together. So I want you to be a part of that. So that's 6 o'clock on Wednesday right here. And then lastly, the screen, the screen will be back up whenever, whenever we're done, but there's, uh, there's information about how to sign up for the Lent devotional as well as a QR code you can kind of scan as you go by as well. So that'll be left up on the screen there for you. And so I invite you to stand with me this morning that God may send us out in his grace and he sends us out by singing the doxology together. Dr. Steve will lead us there. <laughs> 